And here we are again. Welcome to the Mercy Cast, where we are learning the art of compassion through the adversity of life. I'm your host, Raleigh Sadler. Today, I want to talk about those moments in life where our bodies just betray us. Those moments where everything seems to go wrong and we have no idea what to do. We go to doctors, we go to friends, we go to WebMD, which we probably shouldn't because it's just super dangerous. And, you know, we will, if you're anything like me and you can be a mild, mild, I say, hypochondriac, it's very easy to be like, oh no, what's wrong with me? Do you have rickets? I mean, I don't even really know what rickets are, but I don't want them. They don't sound fun. They don't sound like a good weekend. But every one of us has been in that place where our bodies just kind of go and we don't know what's wrong, but we know something within us is not sound. Sue went to Brazil and as soon as she got there, she noticed that something was wrong with her body. She didn't know what it was, but whatever it was, it led to several autoimmune diseases and every doctor she went to really didn't know what to do. Sue was in a scary place. Her health and her future were uncertain. Today, I'm joined by Sue Detweiler, the author of Healing Rain. Sue has been in Christian ministry for over 40 years. Sue, welcome to the Mercy Cast. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. So, Sue, you're in this place where so many of us have been, where something is wrong with us, but we don't know what, nor do we know how to feel better, but we desperately want to feel better. In your situation, what did you do? Well, one of the difficulties is I looked the picture of perfect health. So when I would first go to doctors and talk with them, they, they just thought, you know, I looked perfectly healthy. But I would say to them things like, I'm gaining weight. This doesn't make sense. So they would look at me and act like I had a secret binging problem and I'd pull out my journal and diary. I was a workout person that, I mean, imagine a triathlete, somebody that does push-ups and just incredibly fit and in tune on nutrition. And so I'm like, no, something's going on. So, so they were going with the lowest common denominator. They're like, well, this yes. has got to be it. And you're like, no, that doesn't seem right. Yeah. And, and nobody did a stool sample like they should have. I finally got a doctor. Well, it was a nurse pra- practitioner. Shout out to Danny Williamson from Franklin, Tennessee. But I had met with another one of my healing team, Elizabeth, who's a a nutritionist. And she had gone to Danny and said, I have this patient and you've got to see her because I had so many different symptoms. But basically, once they did the stool sample and once they went down that direction, my GI tract had been contaminated uh, in Brazil. And it had set up a chain reaction when they tested my thyroids. There's antibodies in your thyroid and you're, it's supposed to be like under 60. Mine were 8,000, 10,000. So basically they were attacking my thyroid and that was causing me to gain weight. I had Hashimoto's thyroidism. I had also had really big bulk spots. My hairdresser would have me part my hair different ways, but it was another autoimmune called Allosopia areta. So it was an inflammation problem. And I think the final diagnosis was Sears, which is chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And what that is, it's similar to, we had mold in our house. And so it had been a house that had flooded in Tennessee and we had bought it. You know, you think it's fine, but we had biotoxins on the outside and then we had biotoxins from my GI tract being contaminated. So Sears, what it is, is basically it's chronic inflammation, but the problem is, is chronic inflammation in your brain. And so that impacts all your different systems that are running. 
And so it's really, so C-I-R-S, if you want to find that. And it was really my healing team that helped me figure it out because my body was not doing well. But it took, it took years to figure it out, truthfully. I mean, all of it. And by that time, I had gained so much weight because that was one of the main things that was happening in my body, even though I kept, you know, working out and kept doing things. I'll tell you, it's given me a lot of compassion and a realization that a lot of times obesity can be tied to physical symptoms of health. And a lot of times we will end up blaming the victim who's trying to figure out what's going on in their body. Right. And it's so easy for people just to say, we kind of reduce it to one thing. We reduce it to personal responsibility. Oh, the reason you're having these health issues is because you don't do this enough. You don't do that enough. This is Mm -hmm. salvation by works at its best. This is saying, you don't have this because you're not good enough. You don't have this because you're not working hard enough. There is no freedom. There's no gospel in that message. And I think it's always short-sighted. And I think that's interesting. As you're telling your story, you mentioned something twice. You mentioned your healing team. Could you go into that? Well, God really spoke to me, and this is a, a more recent part thing about a healing team. When we had gone to Brazil to adopt our sons, they were 12 and 8. They were born After we got there, they told us about their family history. So they were born drug addicted, but they also came from a whole line of mental illness. So we really adopted these two boys that had been through extreme abuse. And also in terms of their academic ability, like Zeke, out of a hundred percentile of math, he had a capacity of 0.05. So in terms of even the ability to hold jobs, their brains had been so impacted by the drugs in their system as a a baby. So anyway, think about the stress of raising these two young men. And when Dre turned 23, I got that horrific call. I mean, the phone call that you never want to get. It was from a coroner, and he told me that Dre had died of an apparent Mm. drug overdose. Mm. And he'd been clean for five months, so it was a shock, a shock to my system. Mm. I mean, I could feel my system being plunged back into this dark hole. I could feel cortisol coming into my body. And what began to happen, and I didn't tie it together at the time, truthfully, but I failed a stress test on my heart. And my heart, I began to have heart symptoms where the doctor gave me niacin and he's like, I got to get you to the hospital. We need to do the test with the dye, you know, and the heart surgery as possible. I mean, it was like horrible sort of another thing added to the journey and I'll tell you what happened and it it was miraculous I had an encounter with Jesus it it was in my bedroom and I knew at the time because it was like hot oil from the top of my head and you know like healing this area and then it rested on my chest and then all the way down to my toes And the Lord told me he was healing my heart. And I knew it was a double healing. I knew it was a physical healing of my heart, but I also figurative and literal. It was a healing of my broken heart. Yes. And I found out later that people can die from what they call broken heart syndrome. It's Mm -hmm. not just that you emotionally have a broken heart. It's that it has impacted you so deeply that your physical heart has been impacted. So praise the Lord, I was completely and totally healed in that encounter with Jesus. But 
it was that experience, because you asked me about the healing team, where I was in so much emotional pain. And I'll tell you, I did not have the energy to broadly talk about it. I mean, I was very guarded, of course, you know, our church and people closest to us. But I identified about five people that I was going to really process with. One was we were four square pastors. And one thing that the four square church does a great job is they will hire counselors that pastors could call on at any point. So one of them was a professional counselor. But there were different people that I processed with, along with medical team, obviously. And that's when I began that phrase of a healing team. And I was very specific about it because I knew I didn't have the emotional energy to talk with a lot of people until I was over the hump. Pretty powerful, isn't it? When you think about how God heals body, mind, soul, spirit. And that really was one of the stories that led me to writing Healing Ring. I mean, it, it really was one of those things where I began to process how we need God's healing supernaturally, but we've been created, you know, mind, body, heart. And sometimes we have this residue of a collection of suffering where we need to be able to work at it <laughs> from a deep level of healing and restoration. And praise God, when you do the work with your healing team, it sets you up not only to be healed physically, but to be healed mentally, emotionally, and that your heart is able to minister to others. And so you speak about this healing team and you talk about how it leads to, they can be vessels of holistic healing, like God can use them to help you heal at different mm -hmm. levels. And you experienced that, you know, in your room that day when you felt like God was healing you, you felt not only you're being healed of physical maladies, but also emotional things that you had dealt with because of the passing of your son. And so how did you come about creating this healing team? Were they just people you sought out? Were they different people who like one was a professional counselor, one was a doctor? Like, what did that look like for you? I think it's something that since I've been in pastoral ministry for a long time, my husband was over pastoral care and I oversaw a school of ministry that grew to like 500 students. So there'd be different times that people would have crisis and pastorally, we would often, okay, who are people that can really help with this? And we would talk about a team. I think I never put that phrase together until I was at a point where, wow, this is beyond me. I, I need people. And by the grace of God, they were already in my life. I'm, yeah. I'm very tied to community. Like, even though I travel most of the time, I'm very connected to the local church and, and I show up when I'm in town. You know, it's important to be a part of a life giving community. No, and I think that's so important. Even within that community, having a community, right? Like, we can go to a church. We can experience a service. We can know a bunch of people, but some are nothing more than acquaintances. And even though we may, I grew up in a church where we would sing that song, the family of God. I'm so glad to be part of the family <laughs> of God. You know, we would, we were into that song that was like catnip for us on Sundays. And it was interesting because they didn't always feel like family and it wasn't always the safest place. But within that group, you had safe people. And it sounds like to me, as you're talking about your healing team, you're also talking about people who are safe, who can walk with you when the defecation hits the ventilation, when things happen and you can't control it, when things are out of your scope and you're hurting and you're scared or you're just overwhelmed. You have people who hold the line and are with you. And I think that is beautiful. I do feel like I have that. I, I think friendships are a currency of heaven. You know, I think friendships mm -hmm. are important. 
but I also believe wise counsel is important. And so having a group of people and framing it in such a way, what I like about healing team is it frames it that you're in the process of being healed. You've gone through something traumatic. But God is a healer. That's who he is. And these are people that are going to walk with you through it. One other dynamic that I found because God, when we laid down pastoring, God assigned us to the upper room community, which is mainly 20s and 30s. And, and God spoke to us, Wayne and I, that we were a spiritual dad and mom and that this community, they needed us. But we also needed them. And one right. thing that happened, and yesterday I was reminded of it because I was spending time at the prayer room. They have prayer 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. at night, and it's prayer and worship. And one of my healing aspects, I mean, was that when you immerse yourself in prayer and worship, you come into the presence of God and sometimes there's residual pain that like you've walked through all the steps, you know, you've forgiven, you know, you've done all those different things that you do, but sometimes there's residual toxins. I believe the presence of God brings healing like none other. That's very insightful. Because oftentimes when we're going through things or processing things, we run away from God and others. And in this moment, you're saying we're depending on people, but we're also ultimately depending on this presence of God that does bring that healing. I travel every month internationally and I was in Brazil again fairly recently. And I, I was ministering and it was a pastor's gathering and God revealed to me something about how the body of Christ needs spiritual moms. You know, we talk a lot about spiritual fathers and spiritual fathers are so needed by both men and women. I need spiritual fathers. And often a spiritual father will bring identity and calling and purpose. But what a spiritual mom does is a spiritual mom carries the unconditional love of Jesus Christ. And I believe that that's some of what the encounter was for these pastors is that God was healing their heart through unconditional love. Well, and you've, you've mentioned being at the upper room in Dallas and you and your husband feeling this calling to kind of be spiritual parents. You've mentioned how that idea worked itself out with these pastors and how people are being healed through the unconditional love of Jesus Christ. And I think that is really a beautiful concept and idea. As you're processing this idea of a spiritual parent, help us understand what is it exactly that you mean by spiritual parent? Is this like a godly mentor? Is this someone who guides them in other ways? What comes to mind? Well, I'll tell you, the, the afterword of my book, Healing Rain, I give a call specifically for spiritual fathers and mothers. And, and one of the reasons is the more that I travel internationally, I see that there is an epidemic of orphans. And when I think about the effect of people that have been abandoned by mothers, abandoned by fathers, in toxic churches sometimes where there isn't a healthy family or in, in toxic companies sometimes. And I have just seen it is an epidemic. So as I talk about spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers, I try to do it in a way that doesn't make you be anybody else than who you are. Because really each spiritual mom it, spiritual dad, they're going to have a different personality, you know, different giftings. But part of what it requires is availability. And what happens is when you say to the Lord, God, I'm available to be a spiritual mom to others. And you just say, I'm available because I heard the Lord say, open your heart and your home. They're spiritual 
kids all around you. So you don't even have to hardly do anything. It doesn't have to be programmatic because they will find you. So as that began to happen, I mean, we just began to open our home and we'd have a huge crowd. I mean, we ran out of chairs. People are sitting on the floor just because we created a context of love and fellowship and ministry to one another and relationship. And, you know, right now, (laughs) one of these guys, I mean, it was during COVID that he came to us. He was separated from his wife, you know, had a whole deal going on. He recommitted his life. And now uh, she's out of town for several weeks. So he's staying with us while she's out of town. They've been completely reconciled. They bought a house close to us. They've had two more children. I mean, those are the types of relationships that give life. And so I'm very grateful to be able to be a spiritual mom in an ongoing relationship with Josh and Ellie and their children. I love that throughout this talk, we've been talking about how you've experienced adversity. But again, rather than being drawn into yourself, running away from God and others, you're actually running to both of them. You're running to God, you're running to others whether it's people on your healing team, whether it's people that you are spiritually parenting, there's this very clear focus on others. And that lines up with the whole point of this podcast, learning the art of compassion through the adversity of life. And so that day where you realize the doctors didn't know what to do and you have this gastrointestinal issue, what came after that? (laughs) Well, to wrap up that story, I I really had a beautiful thing happen there, too, because I had returned to Brazil. And when I returned to Brazil, all these stories happen to be about Brazil. I'm in lots of other nations, but I returned to Brazil and I forgot my thyroid medicine. So I inquired of the Lord, what do I do? And, you know, I knew there were different times. You go off thyroid medicine in in a day, you feel like you can't get out of bed. You're, you know, your body's cold. I mean, you know it. You're you physically know it. I heard the Lord say, I'm going to, I'm healing your thyroid. I I don't want you to seek a doctor. I don't want you to go on medication. I was with Randy Clark and Randy and others gathered around me. He has a whole story of, of healing and, and God healed my thyroid. When I, I, I didn't have any of those symptoms and I got home, there are, I feel like truthfully, the only, the only aspect that has not been completely restored is I've not yet lost all the weight that I gained through this process. But other than that, I feel so young. I mean, I feel so vibrant and energetic. It's almost like God's not only healed my gastrointestinal and the, the sears, but which sears, by the way, brings a lot of brain fog and, you know, things like that. Right. But, but he's given me like where it talks about he'll renew your youth like the eagles. That's what it feels like. It's amazing. And I'm so grateful. And I, I, I don't take it for granted. I'm very grateful to God. And so it sounds like you're experiencing a renewed joy as well. Oh, I am. There's a scripture that for, it's probably five years I've been meditating on it. I love it in the Passion Translation. And it's Ephesians 3.20. And it talks about how God will do far more than you can hope for or imagine. It's like he invites you into his dream for your life. And one of the things that happened, I'm beginning to have impact on governmental leaders. So I had prophesied over a woman a year ago in her husband became president in in Kenya in September. 
and we have become friends. So I have been at the state house, I think about four times in Kenya, and I have been able to speak and prophesy over the staff. And so I get home from one of these trips recently. I think it was April. I got home from Kenya and my mother, who's my main intercessor, comes out to greet me. And this is what she says. You are blowing my mind. She's 85. She's been praying for me since she claimed Jeremiah 1, that I would be a prophet to the nation. But what she said to me is, I prayed for things, but now you're doing things that I didn't even wow. think of or imagine or pray. Wow. And it hit me, Ephesians 3, 20, that yeah. we enter into things God's dream for us, not what we thought of. And I love this phrase, God's dream for us, not things we've thought of. So many of us are kind of, we can't see the forest from the trees, you know, whether our malady is physical, whether we are processing through mental health, whatever we're going through, it can be very easy to lose sight of the divine specifically. And how do we tap into God's dream for us? That is a great question. And, and I think that's where the full title of my book, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it because I didn't come up with it. I came up with the healing raid, but immersing yourself in Christ's love to find wholeness of body, mind, and heart. And what I, what I love about it is I love this subtitle because it has this both and. You know, there's healing that we need from habit. I mean, and you think of God's reign, R-E-I-G-N, you know, where he right. reigns in our lives. But you also think about the R-A-I-N, where it's like his reign is coming from heaven. We need to just position ourselves under his healing reign. And as we do that, we're immersed in his love. And when we're immersed in his love, it's an aspect of mind, body, and heart. And the reason why I chose the phrase heart rather than soul or spirit is soul or spirit. That's more the way that the Greeks thought about it. But if you look in the Old Testament, for example, heart was a Hebraic way of talking about the epicenter of who you are, the essence of who you are. You know, that your heart, the knowing God with your heart, that there was a sense in which your heart was the control center of your desires, of the essence of who you are, your emotional life. Right. And so I like using the phrase heart because of the complexity of how God's made us. And there's a complexity of healing that only he can totally heal the parts that are even hidden from ourselves. So hmm. I do a step-by-step -step process in this book where I talk about the mind, you know, and the battle of the mind. But I also bring in things that in North America we tend to neglect. Like I do a whole chapter on rest. Mm -hmm. And part of it is God gave me this acronym, rest, R-E-S-T, revive, expectancy, surrender, and trust. And a big part of my healing journey, and this really was honed into me by one on my healing team that had basically said to me, if you don't rest, you will die early. I mean, <laughs> it was like one of those conversations where you feel the fear of the Lord. And so I began to do things like, okay, I am going to sleep eight hours a night. I, if, if I can't sleep that long, I'm still going to rest. I'm going to be in my room. I'm going to be restorative. And at that point, I was sleeping much less than that. And then I began to embrace Sabbath 
Like even when I'm on the mission field, if I'm there for more than two weeks, I, I plan a Sabbath. I plan a Sabbath rest, even when I'm there. And part of it is God spoke to me that God had established that, you know, we were created on the sixth day. It was the seventh day that he rested. So our first day, it's humanity. We didn't rest in getting all our work done. We rested in his finished work. Mm. And I, I love that because Americans think I've got to get all my work done, then I can rest. And so I had to shift how I did things. I had to be willing for things to drop. I mean that, you know, we get a pride thing about I've got to get this done. So I began to put more margins into my life, but also I really measured a pace of grace. Uh, and I think, I think that itself, healing and sleep and rest, the way that God's made our body, that will be a big deal if you really embrace it in your life. The other thing that I began to do regularly is I began to take communion every day. It, because Jesus talks about that, you know, He's the one that heals us by his stripes. We are healed. We are healed by his blood. And I began to take communion and pray for my healing, but also pray for my family and their healing. And to do that in a way of faith, you know, like creating these places of, of worship in my life on a regular basis, of course, scripture and prayer. And I have one beautiful story about that. My daughter, Hannah, she had had a miscarriage. It was so hard. Then she had a baby and then she was pregnant and she was, she was bleeding. And so she headed to the hospital thinking that she'd completely lost this baby. And I'm praying through the night. When my husband got up, we both took communion and we claimed, you know, the healing of our eight grandchild and it was so amazing like (sighs) that morning i get a text from my daughter it's a subcreonic hemorrhage or something like that and so she was high risk but god healed him in her womb and she carried johnny full term and he is a healthy boy today and i i think of that and do I think communion was tied to it? I do. I do. I think remembering what he has done on the cross is a yeah. huge part of our healing. When you talk about this idea of communion and this idea of rest, and I believe that they are both connected, regardless of our specific views on communion, there is this piece where you are tapping into not only the symbol, but there's there's something there that God, he reveals himself at the table, his body broken, his blood poured out for sins, for us. And we are tapping into, you know, this divine love, which can free us to rest. And I loved your perspective on rest because in one of my first episodes, I did a interview with Rochelle Starr. And Rochelle Starr, we just talked about learning when to stop because she, like me, like you, like so many of us who are passionate and we're driven, sometimes we don't know when to stop driving. We just keep going and going and going and we never hit that rest stop. We never slow down. We never buy that weird bag of chips on the way to the bathroom. We just keep going until we run out of gas and then we're no good for anyone. But as you were even talking about the scriptural idea of rest, I think it's so interesting that when we think back to the first thing that Adam and Eve did after they were created, the f- number one, the first thing was they rested. And the idea is, especially from Sabbath, is that we don't work for rest. Work for the weekend. As long as we get to the weekend, we'll be okay. We work from rest, yes. We take a step back, we take a deep breath, we center ourselves on the truth of who we are and whose we are. 
And then we take a step into life. And I think when we work from rest, I tell people, I'm like, I'm taking my retirement now. And so it's like, I'll take, I'll take breaks because I know when I start getting jittery, I know when I start burning out and I would rather rest preemptively than wait till I'm already exhausted because then I don't really ever feel like I catch up. But how you were talking about, yes, I monitor how much I sleep. These things are important because these connect us to who we are in our body. We're embodied souls. You know, we are, we are in a body. And so when we start thinking about that, yeah, I need to eat well. I need to sleep well. You know, a little physical exercise isn't going to hurt me. You know, it doesn't give me identity. My identity is in Christ, but it's just ways to keep the body going. And then when we do that, everything seems to fall in line. Physical, spiritual, emotional, they're all affected by how we treat our bodies. And so I love how you talked about rest and how you talked about communion. I think those are both very important things because we can so focus on what we do that we miss what was done for us. And in those two things, you tie them together. I think that's really beautiful. Yeah, it is. And, and knowing who God is, is huge. Like knowing his word, knowing that his very name is healer, Yahweh. It's mm-hmm. his very nature. Is it very character? And remembering it that we don't have to beg God for healing. He is our healer. It's already his will to heal us. We simply need to come into agreement with what he's doing. And sometimes, and and I get into this in the book too, is that when sickness becomes chronic, then it's like we've got ongoing symptoms And if we're not careful, we can slip into a victim mindset. And I I know I did. I mean, I I began to, in my searching for doctors, I mean, it's like I'm telling my story over and over with all the different things. And I I don't think I've even mentioned everything. I just had thing after thing. I, I mean, I had an appendix that had to come out. You know, I had double knee replacement. I had a bunch of stuff. And yet, if you're chronically viewing yourself as sick, you get away from viewing yourself like God views you. And and Mm. so I do think that uh, demons can hide behind structures of thought that become strongholds in our mind. And that any place where we begin to agree with the father of lies, we become vulnerable. And so having a mindset shift and a renewing our minds, and that is from the word of God. And one of the things that I try to incorporate here, and in fact, your listeners can download this if they go to my website, suedoutweiler.com. They can download seven keys to divine healing. And I walk them through what Jesus has done on the cross for them. But then I, I give them written prayers, you know, where they can speak them out loud. And in one section, they're literally praying over every system of their body. And if you begin to, on a daily basis, claim, I walk in divine health, and you begin on a daily basis to pray scripture prayer about God being your healer and declaring blessing over your body, that will shift you into a place of being able to receive God's healing because sometimes we put an umbrella up. You know, it's like the healing rain's coming down, but we've got an umbrella of thoughts. And mm. so it's not, we're not getting soaked in his presence because we blocked him through this chronic way of entering into. And by the way, another one that I hear people do all the time, and I did as well. Oh, I'm just getting old. That's almost like cursing yourself. If you think about it, 
And it's not necessarily scriptural. I mean, I understand that there's an aging process. I, I get that, believe me. I, I'm turning 60, so I, I get aging process. But the reality yeah. is that God is our healer. And the word of God says he renews our youth like the eagle. So I'm going to claim that. That's what I'm going to come into agreement with. So those things are helpful. Now that's super helpful. And Sue, as we bring this to a close, what are a couple of pieces of advice or encouragement that you would give our listeners who they're physically just, they're hurting and they could be hurting emotionally and they don't know what to do. What would you say to them? I would say to you, I, I'm so sorry for what you're dealing with. And then I would also try to create a context where they would not feel blamed for what they're going mm. through. And, I, and truthfully, that's where I, I would end up shutting down and not sharing anymore. If somebody, if I felt like somebody was blaming me for everything I went through, then, you know, like a doctor that would look at me and just say, you need to exercise more and eat better. And I knew, I knew that that wasn't what was going on because I was such an exercise person. But anyway, I mean, there, there can be truth in it, but it's not the capital T truth. So one, any blame that's happened, any self-blame, just let that go under your feet. And wherever you are today, one of the things that helped me shift is I have a daughter that's a nurse and she looked at me and she said, well, here's the hard thing. You have several of your systems that you're working on, which when Sears was diagnosed made sense because the brain impacts all the systems in your body. But as a nurse, she just mentioned like these different things. And then I just began to take that list as, okay, we're going to deal with this one. So for me, the answer for my knees, which I had had two knee surgeries in my 20s, the answer for my knees was the miracles in the surgery, and I got double knee replacement. I, I knocked that one out. And you know, God's healing was in there too. But I, I'm going on a little bit too long, so let me wrap this up. Go after whatever you're facing with faith. Go after mm -hmm. it with the knowledge that God is a healer. Go after yeah. it with scripture and prayer, but go after it. Fight for it. It is your inheritance. And even in those diseases like autoimmune, where they will tell you your thyroid can never be healed, believe in faith that God's a healer. And mm. even sometimes the doctor's reports are not your report. And remember that Jesus laid his hands on the sick and they recovered. And also, by the way, when you do that, you will become a healer for others. He wants to baptize you with the Father's love, that you would reach out, not with judgment or condemnation, but with compassion, because being sick is one of the worst things in the world. And you'll become not only a, a healer that ministers to bodies, but you'll become a heart healer that ministers to people's minds and their hearts and brings wholeness to others. Thank you so much, Sue. It's a privilege. Thank you for having me. If you are interested in more conversations like this one, buy my book, Vulnerable Rethinking Human Trafficking. If you want bonus episodes, as well as a plethora of other resources, become a paid member at lmpg.org for $10 a month. You will get access to our bonus podcast, More Mercy, where we dive deeper. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave MercyCast a five-star review. We want to hear from you, so you can email us at info at 
Till next time, have mercy on yourselves and each other.